I would like to call on Dr. Gregory Stanton next. Dr. Gregory Stanton is a founder, founding president and chairman of Genocide Watch. Um, he was a research professor in genocide studies and prevention at George Mason University and the James Farmer Professor in Human Rights at the University of Mary Washington and has taught law at Washington Lee and the University of Switzerland. Dr. Stanton founded Genocide Watch in 1999, having previously founded the Cambodian Genocide Project and the Alliance Against Genocide. And he has served as the president of the International Association of Genocide Scholars. Dr. Stanton served in the US State Department where he drafted the United Nations Security Council resolutions that created the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the Burundi Commission of Inquiry, and the Central African Arms Flow Commission. He also drafted the UN peacekeeping operations resolutions that helped bring about an end to the Moz Mozambique Civil War. Dr. Stanton has degrees from Oberlin College, Harvard Divinity School, Yale Law School, and my own alma mater, the University of Chicago, and I'm very excited and grateful that Dr. Stanton has come to speak here today with us and for us. Thank you, Dr. Stanton. It's an honor to be here. What we are seeing in India today is a divided society that's increasingly divided by the Modi government. And it's intentional. The Modi government is, is intentionally dividing Indian society. As Dr. Varen has so eloquently portrayed it, what we have here is a total, total denial of the basic elements of the secular Indian constitution. We have a triumph of Hindutva, which is a doctrine of Hindu supremacy in India, which Modi and his, his party, the BJP, are attempting to inflict on India, denying the rights of over 200 million Muslims, of Christians, of all other minority religions in India. It's totally opposed to the tradition on which India was founded, to Nehru, to Gandhi, to all of those leaders, those great leaders, and those leaders, in fact, who taught us. Martin Luther King Jr., who is my personal hero, and by the way, who trained me, I was trained by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He studied Gandhi's teachings. That's how he learned how to do nonviolent resistance. So what we're seeing here is a denial of the greatest tradition of India. Not only that, the BJP follows a doctrine that was basically formulated by what is called the RSS, which is essentially a Nazi organization. In fact, the founder of the RSS was pro-Hitler during the Second World War. What we have, in fact, is as Dr. Varen has explained a combination of religious intolerance, of authoritarianism, and of extreme nationalism. When you combine those things, you get Nazism. In other words, what we have here is a Nazi party attempting to take over India. Now, it's not just in India. A Nazi party has taken over, as you know, Russia also. They claim, of course, Ukraine is the Nazi state, when in fact it's not. Ukraine's a democratic state. But Putin's the Nazi. And I'm worried about other countries as well. And let me just be quite open with you. I'm worried about this country. Because I believe that there are certain elements in the people who follow and support former President Trump, who are religious, nationalists, and authoritarians. In other words, Nazis. Watch out for these people. 
The reason why I know this personally is I was a civil rights worker in Mississippi in 1966 doing voting rights uh, work after the passage of the 1965 uh, Voting Rights Act. We were followed around by Nazis. We were followed around by the Ku Klux Klan. And in fact, the entire South of the United States was basically run by Nazis because their, their, their ideology was racist, it was nationalist, it was uh, based on authoritarian rule, and of course it completely excluded uh, any votes for black people in, the, in, uh, their, in those states. That's why the Voting Rights Act was so uh, important. Well, the Klan fought, not only followed us around, one night they shot into our house when I was there. And I was in the back room, but they wounded a couple of my friends in the front. People ask me, well, gosh, you know, you've been to Rwanda, you've been to Cambodia, you've been to all these places, Ukraine at the time of the independence movement. Were you scared? I said, no, I'm not scared. The most dangerous place where I've ever been is Mississippi, 1966. The only place I've been shot at. So we have dangers all around the world. Nazism is making a comeback. And I'm very worried about it in India. I'm very worried about it here in the United States. So don't be <laughs> surprised that we still have these tendencies because racism and nationalism are still powerful forces. And so is authoritarianism. So is religion. When you combine religion with nationalism, that is a sure way to get into Nazism. And that's what we've got happening right here, right now. The so-called Christian nationalists are actually Nazis. So don't let me get into the United States' problem because what we're talking about here, of course, is Manipur. Manipur is a perfect example of how Nazism is now invading India because the Mai Tai in the valley part of Manipur are Hindu nationalists. They want to take over all of Manipur. Uh, the Kuki, who are the most part Christians, uh, are the victims of this. Let me explain to you how the process of genocide works because that's the way at Genocide Watch, how we can predict in advance. Watch out for genocide. The first step in every genocide is classification. You cannot have genocide without classification. You have to have an us versus them. What we've got here is the Hindus claiming they are the us and everybody else is the them. So that's the first stage. The second is symbolization. You heard when one of our speakers explained that just before this May 3rd massacre, people went around and marked the houses of the Kuki. That's symbolization. They were symbolizing where the Kuki lived. Uh, there are also, of course, the churches. Churches are very obvious symbols of Christianity. That is why they burnt 375 churches. Symbolization is a crucial part of genocide because without it, of course, who do you know who the enemy is? The third stage is discrimination, where you know that these people are being discriminated against. Well, that is exactly what the Hindutva people in India are trying to inflict on the entire society. It's why the Citizenship Amendment Act, for instance, which also Dr. Baran uh, explained to you, discriminates very openly against Muslims. They're trying to classify everybody as either a, uh, a native Indian, that is a person who you know, is truly Indian, from those who are so-called foreigners. And people who came to India from Bangladesh, for instance, in 1971, to escape uh, the civil war there, and the genocide there, who came to Assam, and there are literally several million of these people. They're trying to classify these people as foreigners. That's why they passed the Citizenship Amendment Act. It's why they are, have the National uh, Register of Citizens. 
And what they do is they go around, and if you can't prove that your ancestors were Indian citizens before 1971, you are classified as a foreigner. And guess what happens to foreigners because they lose their citizenship? They can be deported. And that's what, in fact, uh, the home minister says he wants to do. Home Minister Shah has called these people termites. That's the next stage, dehumanization. Dehumanization is essential in every genocide. The reason why it is, is because it allows people who are going to commit the genocide to think that their victims are not even human. So they're just exterminating bugs. You know, that was what happened in Rwanda, for instance, where they declared that the Tutsis were cockroaches. Uh, it happened in Nazi Germany when the uh, Nazis declared the Jews to be a vermin. This kind of dehumanization uh, takes many forms. In this country, one of the ways has been when the president of the United States declared all the people coming across the southern border to be robbers and rapists. That's dehumanization. Whenever you hear that kind of dehumanization, you should scream bloody murder because that is exactly how we get into genocide. It's that kind of dehumanization of the people who will be the victims. The next process, and I really prefer the word process because these it's not a linear thing at all. It's not a linear process. These, the next process is organization where you actually have organized uh, groups of people who will attack the, uh, the victim group. Now, of course, sometimes they're very well organized, like the SS was, for instance, in Nazi Germany, uh, like the Ku Klux Klan was here in this United States, uh, how the uh, RSS is in India. So this organization is the way hate groups form. And they, in turn, often then form mobs, which then attack the victims of genocide. So organization is crucial to genocide because it's not an individual crime. It has to be a group crime against another group. You then have polarization, and that's what we have exactly happening in Manipur, where the Kuki, for fear of their lives, have fled into the hills, where the Maitai, who used to be, some of them at least, in the hills, have come down into the valley. Polarization is a crucial step stage of crucial process in genocide. The next is preparation. Now that's what I'm so worried about because of course the chief minister of Manipur is himself my time. Uh, preparation is where the people who want to commit the genocide actually plan it because genocide is a planned series of acts that in fact it's a process. It's not a single event. And the, the people who are planning a genocide will sometimes even meet to do so. The Vance Conference, for instance, of the Nazis is a good example, or the planning done by the uh, Akazu, the group that committed the genocide in Rwanda. Well, that's also happening in India, where the BJP is planning what it's going to do next. It has threatened to extend the Registry of Citizens all over India. That will, in fact, then begin to exclude many people who are currently citizens of India from being considered true citizens of India. The next stage, and this is where you really get into the, what many human rights groups would call pre-genocidal activity, it's persecution. Persecution in which the group that is being targeted will be literally put into concentration camps, or they'll be taken and put into ghettos. They'll have their rights taken away in all kinds of other ways, their voting rights, every kind of other way. Finally, then, you get to extermination, which is what lawyers are then willing to call genocide. And by the way, lawyers are among the most reluctant to ever call anything genocide. I witnessed that during the Rwandan genocide when I was in the State Department, because I I had these incredible battles with the legal department in the State Department because they refused to call it genocide for over three months when it was obvious to everyone that it was a genocide. And 
In fact, Joan Donahue, who is uh, the legal advisor to the Africa Bureau, uh, she was the leader of this group. She said, well, we don't have enough evidence of intent. I said, how much evidence do you need when 10,000 people are being killed a day, per day? She said, well, we don't really know what their intent is, you know. I said, Joan, you know, I don't know whether you really need that kind of proof when, in fact, you have 10,000 people being killed a day. And by the way, Joan is now the president of the International Court of Justice. I was kicked out of the State Department for being a dissenter. She is now the president of the International Court of Justice. Guess, guess who wins these battles? <laughs> but I'm actually glad that I left the State Department because it allowed me to start Genocide Watch. And it allowed us, of course, also to get the International Criminal Court, which the US was one of seven countries to vote against. When we did that, I knew I had to resign from the State Department. And so it did. And that's when we started Genocide Watch. I just want to warn us right now, we are very close to a genocide in Manipur. We're very close to a genocide in much of India, in fact. As uh, Dr. Varen has pointed out, Kashmir is another part of India where it's very close. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a prediction that I make with great reluctance. Uh, when I saw the ID cards in Rwanda, when I lived there in 1988 and 89, saw that they had Tutsi, Hutu, Twa, and naturalized as the four classifications. I said, my God, these are gonna be used for genocide. That was in 1988 and 89. So I went to the, I had dinner one night with Joseph Kabaruganda, who was the president of the Supreme Court. And I said, can't you outlaw this? You know, don't you have some kind of equal protection clause or something? He said, no, we don't have judicial review here. You gotta go talk to the president. So I got a pre I got an appointment with President Harvey Aramana himself, went in, talked to him, uh, and said, look, these ID cards are, you know, explosive. You need to get these ethnic identities off of these ID cards. Of course, he did not want to hear this. He was in favor of the ethnic identities. He was part of this whole mentality of genocide that was already present in Rwanda. Well, as you know, then I said, if you don't stop the genocide here, prevent the genocide here, you're going to have a genocide here in, within five years. That was in 1989. The Rwandan genocide happened in 1994. Now, to use the language of the Apostle Paul, I do not have the gift of prophecy. That was luck. But I will say, it was exactly right. And what I'm predicting here is that if we do not stop Modi and his drift towards Nazism in India, <coughs> India is going to have a genocide as well. And in particular, in areas like Manipur. So I really, I'm sorry to have to make this kind of prediction, but I, we must stop it. And the, the way to stop it, of course, is to use everything we have. The UN, I think the UN could be a huge force here. I think that the US Congress needs to warn about it. The USERF needs to. Uh, everybody needs to be aware. We have a very dangerous situation developing in Manipur, and we have to stop the genocide from happening there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stanton. I, I think, like you said, I think it is urgent for us to act um, because the because it could be much worse. So thank you for urging our senators and Congress people to act. Um, 